Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us in this new session of uh, Internet Activa. And today we are going to talk about access to knowledge. Access to knowledge is a concept that isn't necessarily new, but that has acquired a new dimension in this information age because it perhaps represents the true shift from a, an industrial society to an information society, which we hope will become a knowledge society. And it consists in the ability uh, that new technologies uh, have uh, to provide us access to knowledge, um, not only uh, the infrastructure for which states are now, in fact, uh, in the middle of uh, major discussions as to how to best uh, connect people, how to achieve mass connectivity, etc., but rather the capacity this technology has to uh, place in our hands the devices uh, for uh, transmitting information, which at the end of the day are the way in which we build knowledge. So in this context, it is very important to keep in mind that on the leaving the infrastructure aside, there is still a major debate about the, the very possibility to have access to information. And as part of that discussion, there is a uh, legal approach which is um, of great concern. As Castas said uh, in the beginning of this century, um, the way in which states have reacted to the uh, potential that technology has has been uh, a defensive reaction that is trying to mitigate the uh, the damaging effects that technology can have uh, towards society. So every time that legislation is uh, drafted, it is always uh, in order to prevent uh, child pornography, to prevent cyber crime, and uh, clearly uh, mechanisms for protection are needed. Um, they are not without reason, but this approach does uh, overshadow another aspect, which is the capacity that technology has to facilitate, to interme intermediate, to, um, to, to facilitate the exercise of other types of rights, which is what we want to, um, to uh, highlight. So having access to internet and being able to exchange information via the internet allows us to uh, give a new dimension to the right to education, the right to culture, the right to access to science. It um, gives a new um, dimension to the right to health and to uh, citizen participation, uh, not to mention uh, freedom of expression. So we need to start looking at the internet not only as a place where there are dangers uh, and whether and, and for which uh, we need protection, but also a place where we need to guarantee citizen participation and uh, more democratic mechanisms, both. Uh, for access to knowledge as to uh, citizen participation or freedom of expression or speech. So I would like to focus on the uh, access to knowledge portion of this aspect. Now, the way in which um, these devices is reg regulated, the devices that transmit information, has been through copyright law. And if there is one um, uh, part of legislation where there has been a very uh, a vision that protects copyright holders and uh, that, that criminalizes uh, infringement has been in copyright law, uh, what I mean is that the legal framework for um, the dissemination and transfer of content over the internet is highly um, coordinated uh, or mediated by a law that forces you to ask for authorization for everything and which uh, threatens you, so to speak, with um, uh, enforcement that is uh, criminal in nature. So, so facing this, this very restrictive legal vision, there is a need to start talking about uh, uh, balance. And when we talk about balance, about a positive agenda, we bring uh, the notion that the legislation itself uh, has the balance. It talks about, for example, public domain. So content and materials are not always protected. And when the protection uh, period ends, the moral rights are still kept. So uh, 
having to attribute the work to the original author. But the, uh, the proprietary rights are liberated, and these are the controlled uses that the copyright holder has over the work. So as soon as a, a work moves on to the public domain, it is free for anybody to reuse. And this is significant because so far the public domain had been uh, left aside to some degree. Uh, uh, it hasn't. It hadn't been um, uh, studied uh, specifically, and the legislation speaks little of the public domain uh, beyond defining what the period of time is. For example, there isn't a way to guarantee that the public domain can be enforced um, and that the rights can be enjoyed. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples. There are interesting examples in the world, such as uh, Europeana, which is a a library. Uh, it is a, a project for a digital library of uh, the countries in the European Union that seeks to uh, rescue, to make more visible um, the uh, cultural heritage of the European Union through the public domain. So to gather works in the public domain so that anybody can have access to them. And this project has run into many problems that many n of us knew about public domain, such as orphan works or the possibility of determining when a work uh, enters the public domain because there isn't enough information the difficulties in sometimes obtaining data uh, about that work uh, means that for many works, one doesn't know whether or not they are in the public domain. And the uh, regulations are not clear as to, for example, what happened over the 20th century for works that were never published, for example. So all of this leads to difficulties for people to be able to make use of works in the public domain. And to give you a local uh, Colombian example, there is the case of the uh, Ministry of Culture, which in order to celebrate the 100 years of the death of uh, Rafael Pombo, who was a, a poet and uh, a children's author, a very important children's author in Colombia in the beginning of the last century, the Ministry of Culture publishes a work with uh, the uh, poems of Rafael Pombo, and it reads, this is for uh, free distribution, but all rights are reserved to the Ministry of Culture. So you see that there is very good intention, but it doesn't coincide with the uh, legal information behind this work, because the the poems of Rafael Pombo are in the public domain. So it is very easy to state all rights reserved, but the state ought to recognize when a work is in the public domain. So yes, I'll distribute it freely, but not only that, you can do whatever you want with it. You can, if you wish, um, make a feature film and charge money for it. So to uh, reposition the idea of the public domain and its value for uh, use. And thanks to a series of comments that we provided, the ministry is going to uh, change this. But it is important to point out that um, just as it is important to mention all rights reserved, it is also important to mention when a work is in the public domain. And this is a matter of a culture of legality, not only uh, to favor protection, but also to favor um, a more free access. Other types of uh, balances or equilibriums that we started to talk about and that we want to establish as part of the regulatory framework has to do with exceptions and limitations. If um, f for copyright we protect certain uses um, for the for the author, for the copyright holder, the system itself has a series of exceptions and limitations, which are a way of balancing uh, regulations vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, third-party rights, for example, access to education, access to uh, the right to access to education, to science, to information. And these are all suggested within exceptions and limitations. And we will probably hear much more about this from Michael Carroll when he talks as part of the seminar. But I would like to uh, highlight the idea that many of us uh, don't act with respect to the exceptions and limitations because we are unaware of them. It is possible that many of the uses that we already um, carry out correspond to these exceptions and limitations. So it is necessary to occupy those spaces, to vindicate the possibility of making use of exceptions and limitations. And we need to educate users about the rights of uh, copyright holders, but it is also necessary to educate copyright holders about the idea that their works must be uh, accessible to others in order to create an ecosystem that promotes uh, the production of knowledge, uh, the development of the arts, and development of uh, the science in many countries. So it is worth highlighting that exceptions and limitations are, and then the, the idea of keeping them updated is also an obligation um, uh, by the state. And us uh, citizens need to not only occupy, but also to ask the state to maintain it. Right now, exceptions and limitations are very much lagging behind with respect to our current uh, technological environment. And I'm sure that Michael Carroll will speak more about this. Uh, finally, there is a concept 
um, which is what, where there has been the most work in terms of uh, access to knowledge over the past few years, which is the possibility that we have as uh, as authors to facilitate access to knowledge. And this has to do with what is known as uh, hacking the law. So making uh, the existing legislation to have effects different than those that were originally intended, but still within the legal framework. And this uh, really started with free software. And the, the first, um, uh, the first uh, alternative exercise of these types of rights is the GPL license in free software. And the, it starts from the idea that if I hold the rights, if I am the copyright holder, I am also uh, in a position to give permission, to exert my rights, this time not to control and to prevent access, but rather to allow access. Free software within its GPL license says, okay, um, with respect to the four uses that the copyright holder usually controls, which are reproduction, distribution, public communication, and uh, modification, they say anybody can reproduce, distribute, and, and communicate the work publicly. I'm not going to control it. I allow those uses. I am going to control the right to modification in order to add one condition, which is if you take my work, let's uh, assume that uh, it is, uh, for example, open office, which is uh, free software, and you change it, you are allowed to as long as you, uh, you copyright it under the same license that the work originally had. And in this way, we allow others to in turn modify the new work. And this uh, produces a, a type of a public pool where everybody contributes uh, whatever works we uh, want to reuse. Um, or to have reused, and then we have access to the new developments in order to make additional modifications and to create new knowledge. And from this legal reasoning, um, the idea of creating an alternative to copyright law, uh, making it public and uh, leading to public uh, permission, so to speak, there were a, a, a whole host of new licenses. And Creative Commons are today the most well-known licenses, but the BBC also made some attempts with open licenses. And for example, the government of British Columbia in Canada or the government of Australia also developed uh, specific of uh, free licenses, the open data license uh, in the UK, etc. There have been uh, many designs and many options of licenses that take the same idea from free software, and now say, okay, as a copyright holder now, publicly and generally, I grant some licenses, some, some permissions. But the Creative Commons licenses are now the standard. And from these licenses, we support and have supported a series of movements that, even though they come from uh, uh, volunteerism, they have a very strong impact. Let's think about the open access movement. The open access is a movement that arises within the natural sciences, the hard sciences. And the proposal is this. The business or the way in which the uh, devices are produced, the devices that distribute knowledge. And in this case, the devices are um, articles published in uh, peer-reviewed journals. These articles, these articles are financed or rather are produced uh, not uh, in this in a different way from the entertainment industry for instance rather as a norm the the, the, the money to to produce these research results oftentimes come from the state oftentimes from universities or research centers who pay the salaries of these scientists and also many other uh, say international projects sort of like uh, the, the World Bank etc so this money makes it possible for there to be uh, scientific results uh, and research. However, there is one link in this chain of production which is linked to copyright, which are the journals themselves and their capacity to generate revenue in order to carry out the peer review itself. So open access states the following. If we have a different business model, which is for the most part financed in, by the state or, and other ways, why don't we create a new business model that, that allows peer review journals to continue guaranteeing quality, but that they don't have to close um, uh, the distribution of knowledge in the process. In science, it is very important for others to become aware of the results. That has that allows for impact in citations and also for the development of uh, science in, in other countries. So we are interested in the results being widely disseminated so that 
uh, and anybody who's interested can look at the Budapest um, uh, Convention, the Berlin uh, Convention, or a statement, and the Bethesda uh, Convention that uh, pick up on the, 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 the key points of this. And there have been some very interesting developments, such as the uh, PLOS, the Public Library of Science, which is a journal that is fully open in access that has changed, again, its business model. There's also the World Bank mandate. The World Bank um, uh, distributes a lot of money that becomes results, be it consulting or research or uh, public policy. And the World Bank has said, whatever I finance, the results need to be uh, open access. They need to be published with open licenses. And the same thing happens with the National Health Institute in the United States. And uh, let's bring it closer to our Latin American context. We have um, a bill which is currently in uh, the legislature in Argentina which says that when uh, the results of an investigator of research have uh, been financed by the national uh, budget, then the results will have to be published uh, openly, and everybody needs to be able to have access. So it seems that in, si in the sciences there is a cr clear trend in this direction, but let's look at education. In education, we have the notion of open educational resources, which uh, seeks precisely uh, a very similar thing. Look, the materials that are used in, uh, in the classroom need to be or rather, the, the, the instructor uses it in many ways. Um, one type of material is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the text, uh, the, the school books. Uh, but a text is not the only thing that the uh, instructor uses. And if we can create uh, modular systems where the t instructor can pick and choose what they wish to use, because oftentimes the text is a guide, but the instructor adds elements. Let's say that the, the kids are, uh, you know, they, the instructor asks the kids, um, what does the paper today say about uh, wetlands? Because we're researching the environment in the city of Bogota. Then the kids can go and research. There are many educational resources that the instructor can make a use of. So these educational resources have elements that go beyond the sciences. It is not only important to have access to the data, but rather for the educational center sector, the most important thing is to be able to modify it. Uh, for example, um, an instructor that finds a beautiful simulation about, I don't know, uh, uh, in, in calculus or algebra uh, that is in English, cannot use it for his students uh, in, a, say, in, in a high school that in, in countries like hours off, many of them don't uh, understand English. So he will have to translate it. So producing materials that can be modified and localized to the, uh, to the to the local realities of the, 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 the classroom is very important. And right now, there's a, a very significant mobilization of, of public financing in this direction. There are examples in the US, uh, such as uh, California, uh, which are very clear. But also, in our Latin American context, uh, the case of Brazil is perhaps the most significant. The city of Sao Paulo and also the state of Sao Paulo, both. The city of Sao Paulo has gone all the way, and the state will do it very soon, have um, backed it with public policy. And when, when financing is public and uh, digital educational resources are being produced, they must be open. They must, ha they must have the characteristics that allow for not only public access, but also for modification, which means that uh, open uh, licenses uh, are included. And this would be another aspect in which the idea of um, encouraging uh, volunteerism and linking uh, public financing uh, is has been key. And finally, we have, or rather not finally, but we have another sector where uh, this could be important, which is uh, the case of open government. And in the case of open government, the data, the, the discussion is this. When the state produces information, be it public information or whether it, or when it generates data that are you know, part of its own services, uh, these, this data must be open. And that contributes to transparency, governance, etc. And in this area, there has been a very important movement toward thinking in uh, voluntary schemes for not only public access but also open access. And I think that, that in the in the in the cultural uh, sector, it, it is lagging behind, but things are happening. I mentioned the case of Europeana, and also in museums and galleries and so on. We are going to see some uh, major evolution. But uh, before closing this small. Uh, conversation, I want to mention that the artists themselves are seeking new ways of financing and managing their art 
their uh, literary productions and so on in order to make them have greater access. And now, since it is practically impossible uh, through the criminalization of users to control uh, copying uh, and, and to make that be their business model. So portals such as uh, jamendo.com or uh, the attempts that have been uh, made by uh, the, uh, the author of the Harry Potter series, for example, um, should allow us to put this issue on the table. And um, I'm sure that uh, when we close the seminar during the workshops or during the talk by Paula Arrieta, we're going to delve a lot deeper into those aspects. But I would simply like to close this uh, talk by telling you that it is, we must keep in mind that whenever possible, we must uh, uh, support public access. But when we talk about open access, we are going beyond because we're granting permission to users. Public access happens in a public library because you can borrow a book and read it. But when there is open access, you can take the book, copy it, distribute it. You can um, do a public performance. You can translate it. Um, so when we support access, at least we should support public access, but I hope that we can also push for open access uh, as much as we can. And in this context, we will be able to uh, fulfill the promise of technology and to facilitate access to knowledge. Thank you very much.